You okay, soul? You want something else for that? Silas Soul's knack for being part of history started young. When he was 16, he joined the Jayhawkers, an abolitionist group in southern Kansas. Hey, boy. Where's your paw? Ma and Pa went to go get my brother from the hospital in Richmond. We hear reports some niggers in the area. Seen any? No, but some of those boys came through yesterday asking me the same thing. They said they were given a $20 reward for him, too. Why ain't you soldier on, boy? Ain't you age? I would, sir, but no one's here to take care of my mom and pa. Pa's leg gave out him last season. When my brothers come back, I'm going. All right, you see any niggers around here, you come tell us. Yes, sir. Okay, they've gone. Where we going? Just up the way a bit. Should we wait for nighttime? I don't know how long we have, but we've got to get out of here. Keep quiet. We're gonna go up this way. There's gonna be somebody. He'll be whistling. He'll take you on further. Just up the way a bit. I, I, I don't know what to say right now. Thank you. God be with you. Now get going. Hold it right there, nigger.
While under house arrest for aiding and abetting in the escape of 13 slaves, Dr. John Doy awaits his execution that is to be carried out at dawn the following morning. Using his wits and uncanny ability to think on his feet, Silas came up with and executed a very dangerous plan. Tell them if they don't have the grain here tomorrow, ain't gonna be no hanging. Tell them just have that rope ready. Come on, you mother. Well, what do we have here? Come on, you. Horse thief. Brought him in this morning. Horse thief, huh? Do you know what we do to horse things around here, boy? What? Spend the night with your mother? <laughs> <laughs> Johnson, tell him to make two ropes ready. We got ourselves a late addition. What the hell are you doing here, boy? Got the boys down at the river. We're here to break you out. There you go again, boy. Acting without thinking. Don't worry. You got a plan. They've been saying they're hanging you in the morning. They've been fighting over who gets your boots. Well, thank God for you, boy. If your mother ever hears about this. Guard! Guard! Hmm. What's the matter with him? Bastards. He's all busted up on the inside. Hey, boy. Stupid boy. Turn around. Come on, the boys are down at the river. After the escape of Dr. Doy, Silas attempted a similar rescue of his close friend John Brown after the Harper's Ferry incident, but Brown refused to go, preferring martyrdom. Silas' soul became the most wanted man in the South with a $300 reward on him. After two attempts on his life in Kansas, he moved up north to Boston. There, he befriended the writer Walt Whitman. After a short stay in Boston, Silas moved to Colorado searching for gold, but ending up as a right-hand man to Kit Carson. With a personal recommendation from Carson, Silas joined the Colorado First Cavalry and earned himself a well-awarded promotion to captain after the Battle of Glorietta Pass, the Gettysburg of the West.
clear to everyone here today, this is not a trial. While we will be following courtroom procedures, this is an inquiry ordered by the military and the Congress of these United States to help us better understand the events that took place out at Sand Creek. You will respect the rules of my courtroom. I will tolerate no shenanigans or outbursts. I would like to remind the witnesses here today that they are all still under oath. Counsel, you may proceed. Your Honor, at this time we'd like to call Colonel Shiverton. What is your place of residence and profession? I was Colonel. First Colorado Cavalry, in command of the District of Colorado. Colonel Shivington, could you please describe for us the events out at the Hungate Ranch? Me and some boys from the first were tracking a band of savages where we found a father and son killed at the head of the Plum Creek. We then tracked the savages 30, 35 miles along the front range, where we then came across... Well, I came across the Hungate Ranch? The uh, Hungate Ranch. There it is, boys. Engulfed in flames. Come on, let's go. The bodies of the children were with their throats slit. We found Nathan and Ellen's daughters out front, throats slit. Nathan Hungate and his wife were burned to death in their home. Hair on their heads, peeled back. Found Nathan and Ellen inside, so badly burned I could barely recognize them. Ain't nobody alive in here, Colonel. I don't know what tribe they were from, wagon. but the trail led right to their camp at Sand Creek. In a wagon. After recovering the bodies from the Hungate Ranch, we resumed our pursuit of the savages. That trail led us right to Sand Creek. Your Honor, at this time, we'd like to call Major Edward Weinkoop to the stand. Let me get this straight. Without orders, without notifying anyone of your intentions, you just took it upon yourself to make a treaty with these savages. I never offered them a treaty. I told them that only the governor was able to make such offers. I was following protocol. Protocol, Major? What protocol? The edict issued by Governor Evans that all friendly Indians should report to the nearest fort for protection and supplies. The newly appointed Governor of Colorado and Superintendent of Indian Affairs, John Evans, sought to subdue the rising tensions among the local Indian tribes. I'm pleased to see all of you good people here today. This is a statement that I'm sending out to the peaceful Indians of the Plains. Agents, interpreters, and traders will inform the friendly Indians of the Plains that some members of their tribe have gone to war with the white people. They steal stock, they run it off, hoping to escape detection and punishment. In some instances, they have attacked and killed soldiers and murdered peaceful citizens. For this, the Great Father is angry and will certainly hunt them out and punish them but he does not want to injure those who remain friendly to the whites. For this purpose, I direct that all friendly Indians keep away from those who are at war and go to places of safety. There, provisions will be given to them all. The war on hostile Indians will be continued until they are effectively subdued.
While attempting to deliver Governor Evans' edict, Silas' soul came under attack from a band of hostile Indians. Silas carried his wounded close friend, Lieutenant Kramer, over 25 miles to Clarberry Wagon Stop. Thank you. Well, I hope these work, because this is all we have. Ma'am, at this point, I will take whatever you got. Damn medic from Governor Evans. We were attacked by Kiowas last night. Barely got out with our lives. Got it! Ooh, Kiowas. You're lucky to be alive, kiddo. I think I killed two of them. swear to pay you and your pa back for what you've done for us today. I will do whatever it takes. He's banged up pretty bad. I think it best he stay the night. If you go down Larimer, there's a place on the corner that has room and board. Silas soul fell in love immediately. Sol would visit her as often as he could over the next few months, finding any excuse he could to make the trip, proposing marriage at almost every encounter. Son, bite down on this. If I don't seal this wound, you're gonna die. Were you or your men drinking, Major? No. I have reports here, Major, stating that your entire company was under the influence of alcohol. <laughs> well, some of the men... So your men were drinking. Silas was always well liked by the men in his company, but because of his strong convictions, he always drew enemies. Ah, oh, fuck it. I need a goddamn drink. What's that, Squares? Feeling dry? Well, it wouldn't be if it wasn't for the Major. You heard him. If he catches us with booze, he'll skin us alive. What are you up to? Well, boys, I feel a little dry myself. You're sick. Hmm? You don't look well at all. You're sick, buddy. What? Get up! You're
very sick. You need to lay down. Feels like he's on fire. He's burning up. You gotta get his temper out. I'll be right back. As serious as Silas could be, he loved a good time. He was the consummate joker and prankster, but was often oblivious to the results of his antics. Lieutenant Cannon's come down with the fever something fierce. I'm gonna need some whiskey to bring it down. Sorry, Captain. I got orders. No whiskey for the troops. God damn it, I got a man who's gonna die. Okay, Captain. Calm down. Fucking joke? I got a man dying and you give me this shit? I'm sorry, Captain. I don't know how that could have happened. See? I told you we couldn't get another one. Well, you always ask for it. Oh, yeah. right. Gentlemen, some of the local Indian tribes have extended an offer for a peaceful sit down with us in which we will discuss the exchange of four of our hostages. I will be taking some of you with me. We will travel light and we will expect to return in about a week. Dismiss. And you would call these friendly Indians? After the brutal murder of the Hungates and countless other individuals in the valley, these are the ones you sought counsel with? Under full duress with the threat of them killing hostages? If the army does not comply with the demands for supplies and munitions? Is it in your nature to surrender, Major? To surrender your country, your name, and your very soul to these savages? I never surrender. We'll have order in my courtroom. Order! After meeting President Lincoln in Washington and seeing firsthand the number of soldiers and guns the white man possessed, Chief Black Kettle feared the only way for his people to survive was to make lasting peace with the whites. Facing an extremely hard winter, Arapaho and Cheyenne Chiefs, Yellow Wolf, Left Hand, White Antelope, and the feared Bull Bear reluctantly agreed to join Black Kettle in a meeting with trusted Major Wincoop. Thank you for calling us here.
we have been traveling through a cloud. The sky has been dark ever since the war began. These braves that are here with me, they are willing to do what I say. Our great father is very pleased that you have returned the children. All we ask is to make peace with the whites. We want to hold you by the hand. You are our father. We are glad to meet with you here in peace and in friendship. What you have come here for and what the president chief has sent you here for. I want to ask you to talk to the chiefs of the soldiers here so that they know that we are here for peace, that we have made peace, that we may not be mistaken by them for the enemies. I have come to talk plain with you. We do not object to these things, but we say yes to them. The whites may go wherever they please. They will not be disturbed by us. There is great weight in your words. I can accept your offer of peace, but I cannot offer you a treaty. You need to return with me to Fort Lyons, where you can make a lasting agreement with Governor Evans. Oh, yeah, 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 hold it, hold it, hold it. Yeah. 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 There, yeah. you will be under the protection of the United States Army. Yeah. 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 You will be given provisions for the entire winter. War is coming, Chief. And the only way for you and your people to remain safe is to return with me to Fort Lyon. Accept the treaty and surrender your arms to show that your words of peace have true meaning. We were once friends with the whites, but you nudged us out of your way with your intrigues. But now that we are in council, you keep nudging each other. Why don't you go straight and let all be well, as we are here as brothers in this sacred place? I will go with you to Fort Lyons to meet with Governor Evans. I will go to Fort Lyons. What the fuck are they doing? The rations for the Indians. You know that. What, I gotta sit here and eat tack while these guys eat good meat? If we don't give them supplies, they're gonna be stealing all winter. You really wanna hunt cattle thieves? What are you, some kind of Indian fucking lover? Nathan and Ellie Hungate were too badly burnt for viewing. 
then carried the coffins of the Hungate daughters along the streets of Denver, forcing all, young and old, to view the mutilated bodies at gunpoint if necessary. Calls for revenge and blood were shouted throughout the streets. When are you going to do something about these savages, General? Urgent mission on Fort Lyon, General. What? Attention, General Curtis. Arapaho and Cheyenne surrendered. Request provisions and Governor Evans to Fort Lyon to negotiate treaty. Signed, Major Edward Winecoop. Oh, my God. With the locals ready to riot over the Hungate murders, General Curtis abandoned all hopes of making peace with the Indians. Using the authority granted him by President Lincoln to deal with the savages and quell any uprising that may be brewing, General Curtis called in local hero Colonel John M. Shivington to rid him of the Indian problem once and for all. I hear that you're a man of great faith, Colonel. Yes, sir. Good, good. I need a man of great faith. But are you aware of the problem? Problem, sir. Gold, Colonel. This war is not going to last much longer. Where do you think they will come when this is over? Here, that's where. Hell, I get reports of deserters heading this way every day. Trying to get a head start. But with these savages running rampant across the land, and now the killing of the Hungate Ranch leaves us no choice. The Indian tribes of this land have declared war, and it's war that they shall have. That bleeding heart Winecoop 
have offered them asylum at the fort. I'm relieving Major Weinkoop of his command and I'm giving it to you, Colonel. Thank you very much, sir. It's time to open up this land once and for all. Show no quarter with the Indians, Colonel. I understand, sir. I'm authorized by the Secretary of War to raise a regiment to fight the Indians for 100 days. I want them dealt with by any means necessary, and I want the property that they stole returned. Do I make myself clear, Colonel? Crystal. They will be paid when their term expires. All extravagant expenses, therefore, must be avoided. Let all that can do so enlist at once. I want you to accompany Governor Evans to Fort Lyon immediately. And there you are to relieve Major Weinkoop of his command and ready your man for the campaign. I want them to suffer. I want no treaties. I want no peace. I want them to suffer. Do you understand? I understand, sir. You have your orders. Major Anthony. Major Anthony, I need you to rally me a hundred fighting men. Fort Fort Lyon immediately. Yes, sir, but our men won't fight for free. They'll be paid. Tell the men they'll be paid ten dollars a week. And Major, after the campaign's complete. Yes, sir. What's going on here? Shut up, I'm about to get you paid. As I look down on these young, lost lives, I'm troubled by the fact that I could have done more to prevent it. No more will I look the other way. No more will I pretend to appease these savages. By the grace of God and these two revolvers, I am going to protect this land. It is simply not possible for these Indians to obey or understand any treaty. And I am fully satisfied, ladies and gentlemen, that to kill them is the only way we will ever have peace and quiet in Colorado. It is time to rise up and fight for your families. Make no mistake, it is the lives of your families that we are protecting. These savages have run across our land, raping and murdering for the last time, we must all bear the cost of this fine land, and we must all do our part. Therefore, I am putting down my book, and picking up my guns, and I call upon all able men to do the same. And join me in this moment of our greatest challenge. Your Honor, we'd like to call Major Scott Anthony to the stand. After the Hungate funeral, tell us what happened then. I was ordered to round up 100 fighting men for service against hostile Indians.
Governor Evans. Welcome to Fort Lyon. Major Winecoop, you're hereby relieved of your duties. What's going on here, Colonel? Sergeant, need you lock the fort down. Nobody in or out. You understand me? Yes, sir. Major, you have your orders. What about the peace treaty? Peace treaty? I've got Black Kettle and the others here to sign the peace treaty. Were those Indians, to your knowledge, seeking the government to afford them protection? I was present at an interview between Governor Evans and Black Kettle, in which the Indians desired peace. But General Curtis, by orders, declined to make peace with them. Said that there could be no peace without his consent. Governor Evans then declined a treaty with them. As General Curtis was then in command, I could not disobey his instruction. I followed Major Winecoop, and Major Winecoop proposed that we come to see you. We have come with our eyes shut, following his handful of men like coming through fire. We must live near the buffalo or we will starve. And when I go home, I will tell my people that I have taken your hand and the hand of all the chiefs here in Denver. They will feel well, and so will all the different tribes of all the plains, after we have eaten and drank with them. You've done a great deal of damage. You've stolen stock. You now have possession of it. However, a few individuals who have tried to keep the peace, as a nation, you've gone to war. While we've been spending thousands of dollars building farms for you, making preparations to, for food, to protect you, to shelter you, You've joined our enemies and gone to war. Hearing last fall that you were dissatisfied with the Great Father in Washington, I sent messengers to you to present presents, to invite you for a feast. You sent word to me that you wanted nothing to do with me, also with Great Father in Washington, that you can get along just fine without both of us. I was under the necessity after all my troubles, all the expenses, Instead of this, your people went away and smoked the war pipe with our enemies. I don't know, I don't understand who could have told you this. And no matter who said this, you've proven to my satisfaction that this is the case. I've learned that you understand that the whites are at war among themselves. You think you can drive the whites from this country, but this reliance is false. The great white father in Washington has enough uh, men to drive the Indians off the plains and whip the rebels at the same time. Now the war with the whites is nearly through, okay. the great father will not know what to do with his soldiers, except to send them after the Indians on the plains. War has begun, and the power to make a peace treaty has passed from me to the great war chief. And he could speak for himself, if he chooses to. We will proceed to our village and take back your words for our young men. Every word you say. I cannot answer for all of them, but I think there will be little difficulty in getting them a sense of to helping the soldiers. Did not the dog soldiers agree when I had my counsel with you to do whatever you said after you had been here? Who killed the man and the boy at the head of Cherry Creek? It makes me feel bad to be talking about these things and opening new sores. How can we be protected from the soldiers on the plain? Uh, you must make that arrangement with the military chiefs. I fear that these new soldiers who have gone out may kill some of my people while I'm here. There's great danger of it. Again, whatever treaty must be with the soldiers, not with me. The Comanche, Kiowa, and Sioux have committed more injury than we have. We will tell you what we know, but we cannot speak for the others. I am not big war chief. But all the soldiers in this country, they're under my command. My rule, fighting white man or Indians, is to fight them till they lay down their arms and submit to military authority. You are nearer to Major Winecoop than anyone else. You can go to him when you're ready to submit. Sergeant, escort these men out of the fort. If they try to re-enter, shoot them.
Major Winecoop. I have a word with you for a moment. Colonel. Major. We need to talk about what the U.S. government's asking of us. Take a walk with me. What's going on, do you think? It looks like negotiations are over. I wonder what they came up with. I don't really care, as long as it gets us out of this place. Major, it's a man of great faith. You know how I feel about this country. Feeding savages, taking them in, not only compromises this troop, but it compromises the whole mission. May I speak freely, sir? Of course. I was just following protocol. Protocol, Major? Major protocol hasn't been part of this land in a long time. Well, if it wasn't for protocol, Colonel, what makes us any better than these savages? There is no protocol. Not for this. Major, let me make something very clear to you right now. If you're not with us and you're against us, we do not feed murderers, we do not shelter savages, we do not take part in compromising anything the U.S. government has prescribed us to do. Colonel, it's my job to follow command, Colonel. Command that I give you. Well, remember this, Major. I don't take orders from you. I give them to you. Remember that, Major. As of this day forward, you're relieved of your command. Wonder what that was about. Don't look good. It took Major Anthony two days to round up the 100 men. Like all soldiers, Silas yearned for home. He loved his family and was an absolute mama's boy. Silas rode home often to keep in touch with his mother and sister, frequently sending his entire paycheck back home, always sparing his mother certain details of his life in the wilds of the West, sure to upset her. Dear Annie, I'm still at Fort Lyon. I've been to Denver once since I came down here. I suppose I shall continue in the service for three years or more, I don't know. We've had considerable trouble with the Indians this summer, but they are quite peaceful at the present. The Indians have stole our jackets, and I've had to purchase two already. There are about 3,000 here within a mile of the post who have come in for the purpose of making peace. I don't know what we shall do, but I think the government will not make peace with them. If that is the case, we'll have some fighting to do this winter. I'm not in a very good humor to write this evening, for the wind blows and it's cold and I can hardly see the lines on the paper. Tell mother that I'll go back and visit this winter, but I'm afraid I will not be able to send her money, but if I find that I cannot go, I will send her some sure. I don't know of anything more to write. Write me all that you can think of interest in your next. Give my regards to all the folks in Bath, including the school marms. Yours, Sal. With only 100 days to complete his campaign, Colonel Shivington hey, wasted here. no time in preparing here. his troops here. for battle. Sent John Smith over to the hostile camp to gather intel on enemy position and numbers. You mean we're to attack? You can't do that, Colonel. They surrendered today. You spoke to him yourself. Calm down, Captain. Those are women and children in there. We promised them our protection. It'd be murder. Damn any man or men that are in sympathy with them. Such men as you and Major Winecoop should leave the U.S. service so you can better judge what a nice time we've had on this trip. Any man who would take part in these murders, knowing the circumstances as we do, is a cowardly son of a bitch. So, come on, so get up. You almost got yourself hung last night. What the hell happened? Well, after they hit you, they drug you out here to hang you. 
Why didn't they? Me and some of the other boys jumped in. Colonel Shipp came in and put a stop to the whole thing. So you won't fight Indians? Well, I've been fighting Indians for two years now. Only want to fight back. Where's the Colonel? He's over there. We need to gather enough uh, rations for 20 days. Major, I need this company ready to move in two hours. Colonel. I ain't taking part in your intended murders. As far as going after any of the Sioux or Kiowas or any other fighting Indians, I'll go as far as any other man. You expecting anything different? Form your men up with Major Downing. Yes, sir. Brothers, warriors, braves, I've been to Washington. I met this chief, Abraham Lincoln. The whites are so many, our cousins are no longer there. All I see is whites. They are as many as the trees that cover our mountains. There is no hope, there is no choice. Peace is what we need, our families need us. Black Kettle speaks with wisdom. He has been to Washington and talks as the whites are as they are the stars. It's hard for me to trust them. Do not feed our children. They do not feed our women. My heart is in between. I too agree with Boober. We are the dog soldiers. First ones in, last ones out. They have sent nothing but rancid beef. Flour with mealworms. There is nothing to eat. The children, the women, they are hungry. We will hunt. The dog soldiers will fight. And we will make our stand. You of all should know this, Black Kettle. I have seen the soldiers in dreams coming like ants. Understand. If we do not make peace with these white ants, they will eat us up like they do the grass. If this is our way, the way that we go back to our mother, then we go back. Then we go back. Uh, I'm leaving. We, we will be protected. White people will protect us. How many men? How many men have said they will protect us? How many white? Men who said that they would take care of us. How many treaties have they We broken? are here. This is our place. This is our home. The land will not be yours. They will take it. The Kiowa look for us. We go north. The Cheyenne look for us. We have spoken. We have chosen to, to run or to hunt. Fight. Peace. Or to fight or to hunt no, or no. to feed our families. We what have we decided? Peace, brother. We've chosen to eat. You've chosen the white man. Peace. We listen no more. I thought we stood together. I thought this meant something. I choose peace my children, my people. You have to be ready. What do you think we're doing here? It's best you keep your mouth shut. Gentlemen, what do we got? They're up over that ridge right there. They're just sitting like sheep in a meadow, Colonel. 
Ain't got a clue we're here. Major, it's as good a spot as any. Tell your men to dismount, move their covers. Colonel? Jack, it's off. Now. Yes, sir. Dismount! Remove your covers! And what were those orders? To secure the baggage and the horses from the hostels. Has any attention paid to the signs that they were friendly? I did not see any white flags flying above the Indian camp. In fact, I didn't see any flags at all. Major Anthony, I want you to gather your men. I want you to form a line on the left flank. I want you to hold there until you start to hear fireworks. Sir. Major Downing, I want you to gather your men. I want you to go to the right flank. I want you in between them and their horses. And Major, I want those horses. Yes, sir. Gunners, I want a three-round barrage. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. With one round, spherical case, load. One spherical case shot, load. Shoulder, arms. Hiding up on that ridge. Hell. Hold here, boys. I don't know about you, but uh, I want to get paid. Yeah, yeah. 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 sit here in the bushes. Let's go get that. Let's go yeah, get that. yeah. Let's, go, let's go. Boys went that way. We need to go that way. That's where the money's at. Yeah. Yeah. Right down on the creek there. Some savages. I ain't waiting no more. Who's with me? Yeah. Let's go get these. 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 Let's go get these
Sergeant. Yes, sir? Sergeant, why hasn't Downing attacked yet? Looks like he's having words with Captain Soul there, sir. Sergeant, bring me my horse. You order your men to attack, Captain. There's no way me or my men are going to attack women and children. Major Downing. Well, my order's not clear. Why have the men not attacked? Captain Soul won't follow orders, Colonel. Order your men to attack now. No fucking way, Colonel. You promised me. I'd rather die right here and right now. I ain't killing women and children. Captain, I'm gonna have you hanged for this. Major Downing, gather your men, commence the attack. Yes, sir. You son of a bitch. Do you even Take have up. a plan? Come on, you little savage! No! no. Oh. 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 Come on, you coming, savage! <laughs> Taking any prisoners today. What's going on here?
do now? Well, you got her. She's yours. I got this one. Take it. It's yours. Have it. We're not going to get paid like this. We need to go over here. I think we should stay with the crew. No, man. We're going to break off. We need to make some money. I don't know. I'll follow you. Let's go. What the hell are you shooting at? Well, I'm down there yonder in the bushes. Right there. Look. Where? I don't see nothing. There ain't nothing down there. Let's go. I just saw him. I think I hit him. See nothing down there? I looked up right down there. Uh. Let, let's yeah, go, boys. Let's go let's check go. it out. Cool. I got some. We got a cave here. 
They're in there somewhere. Go around the other side. can pay for this. We need to get you out of here. You know they're going to try and kill you. I need to watch over the men. If they wanted me dead, they would have me killed already. I'm sending you to Denver. You need to get word to Major Wanku. I'll do the same when I get back to the fort. You know they're gonna be watching you, right? Lieutenant, I want a full report of all the horses, supplies, and cattle taken. One in two hours. Dear Ned, after you left here, a battalion of the first arrived, having moved so secretly that we were not aware of their approach of until the pickets were around the post, allowing no one to pass out. Then they declared their intentions to massacre the friendly Indians camped on Sand Creek. I tell you, Ned, it was hard to see little children on their knees, having their brains beat out by men professing to be civilized. Dear Major, this is the first opportunity I have had of writing you since the Great Indian Massacre. And for a start, I will acknowledge I am ashamed to own I was in it with my company. Colonel Shivington came down here with his gallant third, known as the Shivington Brigade, like a thief in the dark throwing the scouts around the post, with instructions to let no one out without his orders, not even the commander of the post. Colonel Shiv got in about 10 a.m. November 28th. We marched all night up sand to the Big Bend in Sandy, about 15 or 20 miles, and came onto Black Kettle's village of 103 lodges.
on the banks of the Big Sandy. On the 29th day of November, 1864, a victory was achieved by you, which is unparalleled in the history of Indian warfare. With but about 600 men after a forced march of over 300 miles, you surprised and routed a force of 1,000 slaying more than half the forces of the savage foe, capturing and destroying all their lodges, and securing between five and 600 horses, ponies, and mules. To Major Anthony, who by his unwavering perseverance and industry, so effectually aided in getting in readiness for the field, his third regiment of Colorado Volunteer Cavalry. And this is much with officers as men, and one of those officers a major cut off ears, all he came across. After the fight, there was a sight I hope I may never see again. One squaw was ripped open and a child taken from her. Little children shot while begging for their lives, and all the indignity shown their bodies that was ever heard of. Women shot while on their knees with their arms around soldiers begging for their lives. The action taken by Captain Sol and myself were under protest. Colonel Shiv was going to have Sol hung for saying they were all cowardly sons of bitches if Sol didn't take it back, and he did not. He told the colonel that he thought it murder. He says in reply, damn any man or many. I think they will try the same for Kramer, for he had shot off his mouth a good deal. To give you some little idea, squaws were known to kill their own children and them themselves, rather than to have taken them prisoners. Shimington has gone to Washington, I suppose, to be made general, and to get authority to raise a nine-month regiment to hunt Indians. I expect Colonel Shiv and Downing will do all in their power to have Soul dismissed. We'll let them work for what they damn please. I ask no favors of them. If you're in Washington, for God's sake, Major, keep Shivington from being a brig general, which he expects. Very respectfully, your well-wisher, Joe A. Kramer.
Nightmare again? Barrett Sandy Creek, in which Colonel Chivington destroyed a large Indian village and all its inhabitants, to be made the subject of congressional investigation. Letters received from high officials in Colorado say that the Indians were killed after surrendering, and that a large proportion of them were women and children. Surrendering must have been the happy thought of an exceedingly vivid imagination, for we can hear of nothing of the kind from any of those who were engaged in the battle. On the contrary, the savages fought like devils for almost 12 hours. This does not look much like the Indians had surrendered. Let's talk about friendly Indians, and a surrendered village will do. But to us out here, it is all bosh. It's that fucking solid soul. Yeah, you're right. Confessed murderers of the Congate family, man and wife, and their two little babies. The scalp and mutilated remains were seen by all our citizens, or friendly Indians, or else high officials wouldn't say so. That's fucking solid soul. Solid soul. I'll bet you that was that fucking solid soul. Drunk enough? You okay, soul? You want something else for that? Yes, Your Honor. We'd like to call Major Jacob Downing to the stand. Were you there at the engagement of Sandy Creek on November 29th? I was. Will you state all that you know in relation to that attack? On the 29th day of November, the troops under my command attacked the camp of Cheyenne and Arapaho Indians in a place known as Big Ben of Sandy. Now, we've all heard these slanderous allegations made against my client. All this talk of friendly Indians, women and children and such. You were there, Major. Perhaps you could shed some light on the subject. How many Indians were killed during this engagement? It is my belief that some 1,500 Indians were killed. I personally counted 200. And of those, how many were women and children? I counted five women and three children in the trenches. Most of them ran off when the attack began. And of those killed, how many did you see that were so-called mutilated? I saw no soldiers scalping anybody. I saw one or two bodies that evidently had been scalped. Evidently, Major? Hell, those savages dug up rifle pits all up and down the creek bed. We discovered three freshly taken white scalps. Savages fought like devils. Savage devils. I was formed in a battle line with Major Anthony. Say we killed about 200. With a cannon barrage. With Major Downing for most of the battle. Well, I heard of a woman being scalped, but I never saw anything. I didn't see anybody scalped. 
I heard major wine coop issues. Were you present at the events of November 29th? Although there were three freshly taken wine scouts, I found them myself. State as nearly as you can the number of Indians that were in the village. From the best, most reliable information, there were, at the time of the attack, about 1,100 Indians. It was an unusual number of males among them. War chiefs of all nations were assembled there, evidently for some special purpose. How many Indians were killed during this engagement? And how many of those were women and children? I cannot state positive the number that were killed, nor can I state positive the number of women and children. Officers passed over the field by my orders, reported that they saw few women and children. I'm of the opinion when the attack started, the greater number of squaws and children made their escape, while the warriors remained to fight my troops. And what properties were captured by forces under your command? There were horses, mules, ponies captured, numbering around 600. There was a large quantity of Indian trinkets taken, most of which had no value. The soldiers retained a few of these as trophies. The remaining Indian lodges, they were burned. What reasons did you have for making the attack? My reason for making the attack on the Indian camp? I believe they were hostile to the whites. Beyond any doubt, they were the same tribe that murdered many persons on the Arkansas and the Platte. It is impossible to determine what band or part of any tribe they belong to. The most that can be ascertained about these Indians from these tribes is that they've declared war. In this view, I was supported by Major Anthony. That'll be all, Colonel. With all due respect, Your Honor, must we proceed with this slanderous attempt to destroy my client's stand in the community? Is it in the best interest of this court to stand by and listen to these unsubstantiated claims and outright lies of which this witness has a personal vendetta, all of which relates to a poor, if not dismal, service evaluation? We only have one more witness for the day, Council. We will proceed. Very well, Your Honor. We'd like to call Captain Silas Soul. Were you present at the events of November 29? Yes, sir, I was. Was any demand made upon the Indians prior to the attack? Not to my knowledge. Were women and children shot while trying to escape? They were. Were women and children scalped or otherwise mutilated by any of Colonel Shimington's command? They were. Tell us, Captain, what did you see? I saw a woman with a baby lying on the ground. And the child was crying. I then saw a man pull out his pistol and blow off the top of the child's head. I saw women and children begging for their lives, if that's what you mean. Were any efforts made by commanding officers to prevent these mutilations? Not that I know of. About how many scalpings are we talking about? One, 10, 50? All of them. I didn't see a man, woman, or child that hadn't been scalped. Except for the one that was burnt, I couldn't tell if she was scalped or not. Do you know what became of the stock and the other property taken from the Indians? Every single one of them took something. My record's well known and well documented. So is the record of the Indians. It isn't me who killed the Hungates. It isn't me who shut down the roads, trying to starve out the territory. Is it suddenly a crime for a man to defend himself and his country? By order of the President of the United States, 
There are to be no civilian charges filed upon any of the citizens who perpetrated the event known as Sand Creek. Colonel Shivington, when, sir, is your military commission over? My commission ended in September. I can't have a military inquiry with someone who's not in the military. These proceedings are adjourned. Wait, before you go, I have to say, Sand Creek was a cowardly and cold-blooded slaughter, sufficient to cover all its perpetrators with indelible infamy and the face of every American with shame and indignation. Once the official investigation was closed, Silas was finally able to settle in Mary Hersa. Soon after, he was elected sheriff of Denver. Don't worry, baby, I'll be back. I gotta go to work. Silas Soul was murdered in the streets on April 23, 1865 by the coward Charles Squire. Silas was 26 years old. Squire was able to evade capture for almost two weeks until he was finally caught by Joseph Kramer, Silas's close friend. After returning Squire to Denver and getting a room in Lower Downtown, that night Charles W. Squire escaped jail and was never seen again. Kramer was found dead the next morning. Causes unknown. John M. Shivington paid a small price for his role in the massacre. He was shunned from ever entering into public office again. It was rumored Shivington was semi-regretful of Sand Creek later in life. He died in Denver from cancer in 1894. Major Jacob Downing left the military after Sand Creek. From the breeding and sale of the stock he received for his part in the massacre, Jacob Downing became one of the richest men in Colorado. Major Scott Anthony, the cousin of the famous woman suffrage leader Susan B. Anthony, resigned from the Calvary after the massacre. He also became very wealthy from the breeding and sale of the stock he received for his part in the massacre. He died of hay fever in 1903. Major Edward W. Winecoop, the man who decided to name Colorado's capital Denver, left the military shortly after Sand Creek. He moved around, ending up in Deadwood, South Dakota, 
It's rumored that he played cards with Wild Bill Hitchcock the moment Hitchcock was assassinated, when Coop had many children and lived out his days in peace. Governor John Evans was removed from office. He became a philanthropist, constructing many buildings and churches in and around Denver. Black Kettle survived the massacre only to be cast out by the tribes. Old fool, they called him, blaming him for leading his people into slaughter by the white man. Bull Bear went back to the dog soldiers after the massacre. He fought at Little Bighorn and Gaul's charge up Medicine Tail Coulee. He never gave up hope for peace with the whites and stride for it most of his life. His son was the first native to attend a white university. No criminal charges were ever filed against anyone who took part in the massacre at Sand Creek. <laughs> <laughs>